I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegas, and I'm here today with IHMC's director, Dr. Ken Ford. Hi, Don. Good to be here with you and to briefly discuss the interview that you and Tom Jones did with Dr. Pascal Lee. As everyone will hear on this episode, Pascal is a remarkable fellow, an artist, helicopter pilot, polar researcher, planetary scientist, and a pioneer in thinking about possible human futures in space. Pascal and I share a passion for the moons of Mars, especially Phobos, really one of the most interesting places in the solar system from my perspective. I really enjoy my conversation with Dr. Lee and Tom Jones. What an interesting couple of guys. I understand that you and Pascal were both at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California for a short period of time. Yes, we overlapped at Ames for a couple years at the end of the 1990s. Cool. Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the blushingly wonderful five-star reviews piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continuously and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye towards selecting the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read here on STEM Talk. And as always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname Podcast File, and here's the review. The STEM Talk podcast is a must-listen. I appreciate how the format of the podcast stays focused and on topic. It is packed with outstanding content that lives up to its name. I truly found useful information and perspectives that impacts how I understand and see the world. I am highly looking forward to future podcasts. Well, thank you, Podcast File, and to all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, and now on to today's interview. Dr. Pascal Lee is a planetary scientist working with two nonprofit research organizations, the Mars Institute, of which he was the co-founder, and the SETI Institute. He is also director of the Houghton Mars Project at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. Pascal's research focuses on Mars, asteroids, and the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Pascal is also very interested in advancing the human exploration of Mars and has been extensively involved in an ongoing field research project on Devon Island in the Arctic that's helping plan future human missions to Mars. Dr. Lee is also an artist, a helicopter pilot, and a flight instructor. Pascal's first book is titled Mission, Mars, and is a training manual for kids interested in going to Mars. STEM Talk. 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 So today I'd like to welcome Dr. Pascal Lee to STEM Talk, and we have NASA astronaut and IHMC senior research scientist Tom Jones, who's also joining us today. It's a pleasure to get to talk to you again. Welcome. It's good to be here. So Pascal, just give us a little bit of your history, your background is with respect to how you became a scientist, and specifically a planetary scientist. Well, I, um, I was born in Hong Kong, which if you want to become a uh, an astronomer or, or study Mars is one of the worst possible places you could, you could start your life. Uh, but um, I spent my little childhood there. And that actually was an, an exciting time for me um, uh, because I, my father was, was, uh, was ethnically Chinese. My mother was French. Uh, and I was living in this very exciting place called Hong Kong. It was really booming at the time. So um, anyway, that's where I was born, and, but I wasn't doing well in school. So at age eight, my parents decided to put me in boarding school. So I went to boarding school, and of all places, in, in France. And I didn't speak the first word of French. Uh, so <laughs> I started a new life, basically, at age eight uh, in a boarding school in France. And I stayed in boarding school for 15 years. I would go back to see my parents in the summer, uh, but uh, the rest of the year I was, I was in, in France. And, uh, and I was... Uh, very often with my grandparents as well. They they would see me on weekends, 
And then, um, but as I was growing up in France, I was uh, already dreaming about uh, turning what I was seeing on TV that was science fiction into into reality. I always loved space travel. Um, I thought that was uh, really inspiring and, and exciting. And it wasn't just the travel itself. It was the, the notion that there was more than to the universe and to life than what we had on Earth. And the, the universe was, was, was calling. So... So uh, Mars came into the picture a little later uh, when I was became a teenager. Uh, that's when I got serious about actually becoming a, a scientist. Um, until then, I was I was interested in science mainly from through you know books like Jules Verne's uh, Adventures or, or TV science fiction on TV or in the movies. Um, but when I became a teenager, I, I really got interested in in planetary science and, and figuring out what the planets were like. And I remember one book that really changed my life at the time was, was Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmic Connection. Mm-hmm. It wasn't his book Cosmos. He wasn't completely world famous then uh, with the Cosmos series. It was before that. He wrote this little book called The Cosmic Connection. And I thought it was really an, uh, an amazing book. And, and so from that day on, I, I decided that the planetary science is what I wanted to do. And that became every, the rest became easy because once you have a goal and a focus, uh, you know you, you sort of it it makes a lot of decisions for you. And so I I went on to study science and physics at the University of Paris. And then being a French citizen, I had one year of national service to do. At the time, there was still a draft, so I applied three year, three years ahead of time for this one position that the French military was giving out every year uh, for one soldier, which was to go to Antarctica. And so I really wanted that slot, that opportunity to go, to be, um, to spend a year at, a, at an Antarctic station. And, and so I applied three years ahead of time. And when the time came, I was lucky to actually get selected. So uh, after I was done with my college years in Paris, I uh, went to uh, Antarctica for one year. And as, and I, I still was not an astronomer or a planetary scientist. I'd studied geophysics and geology. Um, but on my way south to Antarctica, I posted a letter. It was an application to one graduate school. I didn't know better at the time. I figured I should go to the graduate school where Carl Sagan taught. And I applied for grad school. And, and that was it. Mm-hmm. So somewhere in Singapore, I posted this letter to a grad school and in the U.S., and I went my merry way down to Antarctica, spent a year there. And in the middle of the winter, I get this telex from Cornell uh, saying, hey, uh, Pascal, you've been accepted. We're happy you, to have you join us uh, next fall uh, in Ithaca, New York. So that was it. So after my national service in Antarctica, I spent 402 days um, at, at the station called dumont Dieuville Station. It was a life-changing experience for me there. Yeah, can you tell us? Yeah, I was going to say, can you tell us what that was like to live there for over a year? Well, for me especially, I mean, I all I had known were big cities. I grew up in Hong Kong and Paris. Um, even when I was in boarding school, I was near Paris. I was an urban kid, and he, and of course, I I figured Antarctica would be a lot like Mars. So that's why I was so eager to go. And sure enough, it was exactly that. It was it was an otherworldly experience. Um, uh, we were just 31 people uh, wintering over. Uh, the, the station was sort of not small by Antarctic standards, but not large either. Sort of run of the mill. It was only guys at the time. There, there was there was no gender mixing uh, still in the 80s. Uh, and uh, anyway, that was just a life changing experience. We, forever in my life, there will be before Antarctica and after. Uh, before Antarctica, everything was sort of, um, you know. Uh, what every kid goes through, I guess, most of the time. And Antarctica was sort of the first life-changing, real, really different adventure that I had in my life. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I remember the best, of course, from Antarctica is the fact that just before we were left to winter over, uh, the day the ship was sort of departing, um, and the crew of 31 was left behind to winter over, we were all offered a helicopter f- a flight, a helicopter ride around the base. And that was my first time ever in a helicopter. And I was lucky. I got the front seat. The pilot took off. 
gave us a tour of our of our base just to give us get us familiar with our surroundings. We were going to be left there for a year, and um, at some point he really left the coast and went out to sea in a helicopter. Now you're talking about the you know the thundering sixties here, the roaring fifties, the thundering sixties, <laughs> and uh, and he um, first of all he flew th- he flew through a glacier. And that was like flying through downtown Manhattan with uh, ice cliffs on either side. It was just an amazing uh, thing. But at some point, he flew out to sea and landed on an iceberg. Uh, and I thought, you know what? This is this is just uh, totally amazing. Uh, as soon as I'm done with my studies, I have—I mean, with uh, Antarctica, I have to learn how to fly one of these. The helicopters are sort of like the lunar modules of the Earth. They they take you exactly to where you want to go Mm -hmm. Uh, and they do a spot landing and you walk off and you're sort of in a different place so anyway that was that was what Antarctica did for me it was sort of an eye-opening experience in in many ways Uh, so the the acceptance to grad school was sort of icing on the cake it was fantastic icing got me going and uh, when I came back I went to Cornell for I spent a few years there Uh, Got my astronomy degree. I ended up being Carl Sagan's last TA. Um, he was not my advisor. My advisor was his student, his former student, Joe Viverka. Uh, but uh, Carl was very busy at the time and running around the world. But um, I became his last TA on a class that he taught. And after that, he, he passed away uh, in the late 90s. Uh, so, so uh, But after a few years of weather in Ithaca, I thought, okay, I'm done with the cold. <laughs> I'm done with the cold. I'm done with the snow. And, uh, I had to get a postdoc in a place that was warm and dry, and I had my eyes on NASA Ames in California. And so I applied and got a postdoc there, and I've been at NASA Ames ever since. That was it. So that's, I'm sorry it took so long. That's the, that's how I got here. <laughs> So Pascal, so you just talked about the the 402 day winter over, which had to be just an incredible experience. Like you said, it's probably the most relevant thing to being on Mars that we can find here on Earth. Can you tell us more about what that was like, just from the human perspective? Well, uh, it, it's funny because um, I had read a lot about polar exploration before I went. I I was expecting uh, it to be really trying psychologically, the isolation, the remoteness. And in the end, I I, I took more books than I could read. I I was so busy uh, doing my work, uh, exploring around with with colleagues and friends, um, uh, helping out with life at camp, uh, that uh, the year went by really quickly. Now, I think if I had to spend a second year uh, things would have gotten you know more more trying, maybe more tedious. But the first year was just uh, one adventure after another, one discovery after another. So it was it was very exciting for me. I never, uh, I can't say I experienced boredom one minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, the 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 truth is, however, uh, is that in an environment that is that remote and that uh, isolated. What happens, and that's not even new from my experience, but I sort of lived it for the first time, firsthand there, uh, is that you're in a very resource-poor environment. And that would be true for a human mission to Mars or or even on the space station is my guess. It's resource-poor in the sense that you only have so much you can count on and the rest you can't go to a store for, you can't really uh, get. Uh, And so all of a sudden, small things take on you know, a life of their own and are, are bigger than, than life, you know, sort of, you know, who took my seat or <laughs> <laughs> who, t- who borrowed my pen, uh, you know, who, who stole my this or that. And I'm not describing how I felt, but you just realize that that's how tensions arise. It's, it's not so much, um, uh, it, I think it comes from the combination of the fact that, you know, we human beings are need a certain level of comfort to to be happy uh, or, or knowledge that we can access you know this or that and when we don't that's when all of a sudden you know you become a lot more possessive of what you have and and, and guarding so that's one thing I experienced firsthand another might be the fact that in a team like this of 31 people you're not in a small crew I mean 31 people is, is compared to a small crew going to Mars you know where you might be four to eight people it's um, 
it's a it's a big group and and so in a big group like this, you can have different outcomes in terms of how the the psychology evolves but th there's generally two directions: one, you either have a strong group leader uh, you know say the base manager who somehow wants to uh, exercise the that role or or has the personality to do it and and the whole team therefore is behind this person and it's sort of it's it's the epitome of that was the case of Shackleton's expeditions or where you know he he was really a very big group uh underneath him and the group that was underneath him was his whole team was not split up into subgroups um in other instances the other direction that an experience like this can go is when the team leadership is not very strong or not strongly exercised uh then then the group splits up into smaller factions and they're not at war with each other that's totally exaggerated but they they you know you sort of see cliques uh, arise uh, this happens on ships actually it happens on, in larger groups that are isolated and remote uh and so ships or submarines uh and so you get cliques people who just you know uh, hang out together much more than with the others just because they get along better mm -hmm. and and so that's that was my experience in, in my winter over uh, we were sort of broken up into into cliques. Uh, uh, I personally, actually, uh, uh, I mean, truthfully, got along with pretty much everybody. I mean, I didn't have any special episode, or so you know. There, there, there are those who then serve as ambassadors, if you will, between the cliques. So I was in that group, but but uh, that, that's sort of what happens. And I wasn't in a position of leading the whole expedition either, of course, because that wasn't my role. Plus, I was you know very junior in the whole, whole system. Um, I had no experience with Antarctica either, so so that wasn't my place. But um, I could I could tell that things could have been led differently. I shouldn't say better. I don't say better. I should say differently. And um, but that was the experience that we had. We, we were broken up in cliques. Um, so what else? Um, you still have I, all your toes. I still <laughs> have my toes. Although I fell through the sea ice, we were mm. walking out to some islands on on frozen sea. It's really re remarkable. I mean, you—it's sort of a religious experience, uh, almost. You, you sort of see islands in the distance, and you can walk over to them, knowing that you're walking under, you know, just over three or four feet of ice, and underneath there's there's an abyss, um, so of dark, cold, gloomy water. Um, so anyway, I was walking out to to the island, and you know, we we get comfortable and complacent with with that experience because the ice is pretty solid. Uh, we would even jump over leads, which are cracks in the ice. Uh, but then at some point, the art, the ice got a little darker. And I think it's because there was some current going on there. and uh, Or there was a lead that was open not too long ago, and it was only barely refreezing. So anyway, the, the ice got darker, uh, and I, I didn't uh, believe that somehow it would be thinner that much, more thinner. And sure enough, it was. So I, I fell through the ice, and that gets your attention really quickly. Mm. Uh, so I was uh, I was lucky to to be able to swim back to shore, which was the edge of the, the ice. I mean, I was right there, uh, and then uh, threw one foot onto the ice, which allowed me to essentially get out of the water. And then uh, my friends came rescued me too. So anyway, that was that was. You proceed a lot more cautiously over sea ice after that. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. What kinds of interests in planetary research did you get into after you uh, arrived at Ames? And what, what have you spent most of your time on? What's your enthusiasm today? Yeah, well, I think a driving force behind, a driving motivation behind my, my original interest was always the search for life, the possibility of life. And I'm certainly not unique in that regard. I, I believe you, Tom, and many other planetary scientists who, who uh, go into this business are really excited by that prospect. So that was sort of the the fundamental uh, motivation for being interested in what's out there. But um, in my case, I got particularly interested in places you could one day go to. I thought that 
first of all, was more exciting. There was more promise of of uh, discoveries and hypotheses you could test. There was more promise of progress in your within your lifetime. So I was interested in places you could you could eventually travel to, uh, the moon, uh, asteroids, Mars. So at first, when I got to Cornell, I wanted to do a thesis on Mars, but there was no new data. There was no new data, and I was talked out of by my advisors to do a thesis on Mars. And meanwhile, there was brand new data on asteroids. The Galileo spacecraft, NASA's Galileo spacecraft, was on its way to Jupiter. It was about to fly by the first asteroid ever flown by by a spacecraft, uh, 951 Gaspra. And then Galileo was going to fly by uh, a year and a half later uh, another asteroid, 243 Ida, which turned out to have a moon of its own. So it, it, those were exciting times in asteroid science. Plus, I was interested in asteroids anyway. I was interested in asteroids and their impacts. So, so my thesis at Cornell ended up being on asteroids. And I say all this because as soon as I was done, however, I wanted to go back to plan A, which was to study Mars, um, uh, Mars and the search for life there. So when I joined NASA Ames, my proposal for, for postdoc work was to actually um, uh, study a place on Earth that would be uh, one of the most Mars-like places possible and to learn how to um, uh, search for life on Mars. So this was another way for me to also go back to the polar regions. You, when you, Once you go there once and you enjoy your trip, you sort of want to go back. So uh, I should say that while I was in grad school, I actually managed to go back to Antarctica to look for meteorites uh, one summer, one Antarctic summer. Um, so I had already been twice to Antarctica by the time I graduated. So once I got to Ames, uh, my proposal was to go to the Arctic, so the other side of the Earth, in the North Pole instead. I go to the Arctic to check out this uh, place that I thought must be amazing because it, it was Devon Island. Uh, it, uh, it was the largest uninhabited island on Earth. It had a large meteorite impact crater, which Antarctica uh, does not have any that I exposed at least. Um, and this meteorite crater is, is 20 kilometers across. It's gigantic. I mean, it's much bigger than meteor crater in Arizona, for example. And Houghton Crater uh, was the only terrestrial impact crater known on Earth. We know about 200 of them. Um, it, this one was the only one that was set in a polar desert. An environment that was cold, dry, rocky, barren, uh, unvegetated, dusty, windy. <laughs> uh, and if you were to describe Mars, I mean, that's essentially what you'd say about Mars. It's, it's exactly that. Although, I, we all know that Mars is much more extreme in, in, in all these parameters than the Arctic is. But anyway, it was potentially a step in the right direction. And I wanted to understand how this crater had weathered through, through time, uh, whether or not, for example, we could find um, ancient hydrothermal deposits from this impact. Because an impact is a very energetic event. It dumps a lot of heat into the ground. It can uh, sustain a hydrothermal system for quite a while. In other words, circulation of hot water through the rocks. And so this was sort of a, an interesting set of questions you know, how are these things preserved in the case of a large impact crater on the Earth in a cold environment? Uh, and, and what might we expect to realistically find on Mars if we went to the same kind of setting? Mm -hmm. so, so, but as it turns out, the postdoc was turned down the first year. I was still in grad school when I, when I proposed it and was turned down the first year, so that wasn't good news. Uh, but somehow, I tried to, to submit the same proposal the second time and the second time it passed with flying colors. So uh, management had changed in the meantime at NASA headquarters. So it depends on who reviews your proposals at some level. <laughs> yeah. uh, and this is the truth. The proposal was essentially unchanged. Uh, so it got accepted the second time. And, uh, and so that was it. My postdoc was about studying Mars. But through uh, the exploration of a site on Earth that might be Mars-like, that had the promise of being Mars-like. And within a month of joining Ames, I went up to Houghton Crater. And my and the minds of my colleagues, we were three others, so four people in total, we were, our minds were blown, were blown away by what we saw. The, 
the analogies, the uh, interesting geology, the weathering state of the landscape, the amount of expressions of the presence of ice in the ground, uh, all of these things were uh, seem to have Martian equivalents. We could, I was recognizing as I was driving around on Devon Island or flying around in a helicopter that we rented, um, I was recognizing the landscape of Mars there, here and there. So uh, we knew right there from our first summer on Devon Island that this was a place we'd had to go back probably for many more years. And so, so that's how the project started. What's been your most recent experience up at uh, Houghton Crater? So here we are this year, 2016. We are in our, looking at our 20th consecutive field season on Devon Island. We've uh, I've spent the last 19 summers of my life on Devon Island. This is going to be our 20th. And the place is not abating in, amount of, in the amount of uh, Mars-like features and lessons we can learn from it. Um, we, we go to this place for two uh, research programs, fundamentally, two reasons. One is to learn about it so that we can interpret the Martian landscape better and the evolution of Mars over time. So this is sort of the comparative planetary or planetology aspect of it. Um, the other reason we go there is because we are using the place. We're using the place as a, as a, as a set, if you will, in the sort of a movie sense of the word, as a set where you can test uh, equipment, hardware, for example, spacesuits that astronauts might one day use on Mars, or rovers that they might use to drive around, or drills that uh, astronauts or robots could deploy on Mars to access the subsurface, or airplanes or drones that we might fly on Mars. Um, so the place is an amazing place as a as a sandbox, if you will, as a, t as a testing ground mm -hmm. for hardware uh, that we might want to deploy to Mars. But more importantly than just hardware, it's also an amazing place to test procedures, operational procedures, to learn how to explore. It's not just the hardware that you might use, but also the strategies that you would employ. Uh, how many people should go out at a time on, on these excursions? What's the optimal number? Should you be five? Should you be three? Um, you know, what are the roles of the people on, on, an, on an excursion like this? Does everybody look at rocks? Do you need three geologists at a time? Or uh, is one person taking care of safety and the two others are focused on exploration? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, these are not uh, unimportant questions because I think that unless you understand exactly what it takes to do field exploration and, and how it's done best, how it's optimized, uh, you don't have really good requirements for what you want to design and take to Mars. If you don't have good requirements for that, you're, you're going to come up with solutions that are not optimal. So, um, so uh, to answer your question, Tom, uh, this summer will be, again, a mix of science and exploration. Uh, the science, we're still trying to uh, quantify the amount of weathering that has happened at this place. Uh, because since we know the age of the rocks and we know also the age of their exposure to to the climate and we also know what the climate has been doing over over the past uh, uh, centuries and millennia, we have a better sense of the erosion rate that this climatic history has imposed on this landscape. And so in conversely, we can then apply, um, we can compare what's preserved at this crater with craters on Mars and come up with upper limits. In other words, uh, maximum amounts of weathering that would have gone or taken place on Mars given the preservation of Martian craters. Uh, so so um, that's one thing that will be our focus. Um, another focus is, uh, is the study of valley networks. Mars uh, has, especially on its most ancient terrain, but also on the flanks of some of its most, some of its most recent, recent volcanoes, Mars has these little finger-shaped valleys that are known as valley networks in the business, the small valley networks. The small valley networks are very intriguing because uh, they imply that water was flowing at the surface of Mars, not in torrential uh, sort of um, discharge rates, but in trickles, so to speak, like a, like a small river that's sort of cutting through the landscape. For that to be possible, uh, the... 
uh, everybody agrees that you need to have a higher pressure uh, uh, prevailing above this water to allow it to flow like this at a trickle over, over long distances. Now, the immediate answer that was given to this uh, uh, enigma is that Mars had a higher pressure from a warmer and thicker atmosphere in its past. Uh, this is where this whole idea of Mars being warm and wet early in its history comes from. It's from the fact that we're trying to explain how it could possibly have carved out these little valley networks um, uh, involving only a trickle of water uh, over uh, early in its history. And so the solution seemed obvious. You need a thicker uh, environment, a thicker atmosphere. So, so that's only possible. The atmosphere was substantially thicker and warmer. Uh, and, and that became known in the business as the early, the faint early sun paradox. Uh, because uh, while it's easy to say the atmosphere of Mars early in its history was thicker and warmer, it's actually very difficult to achieve in models. The sun itself at the time was about 25% dimmer than it is today. Uh, the sun was a young star, it was still sort of turning on. And um, at the time the valley networks were forming on Mars, the sun was a dimmer star. And so it, it makes the problem even more difficult than it is today, mm -hmm. uh, than it would be today, to make early Mars have a thicker and warmer atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this has actually led climate modelers into uh, uh, a sort of a vicious circle of modeling, I would, I would call that, for the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, they have come up with extreme scenarios of two bars, in other words, twice as thick as the Earth's atmosphere, two bars of CO2 with CO2 clouds to possibly uh, warm up the atmosphere and make it thick enough to allow liquid water to flow over you know, tens of kilometers at its surface. It's very difficult to achieve. It's very ad hoc, and um, and where's this atmosphere today? Where are where's all the CO two that if there was water, at the surface would have dissolved into giant deposits of carbonates? Mm -hmm. We find a bit of carbonates on Mars, but not gigantic deposits of carbonates. Uh, so not like limestone rocks that we have here on the Earth. So uh, the problem, however, went away from our work on Devon Island when we saw the valley networks on Devon Island which had uh, incredible similarities with the valley networks of Mars. Uh, we thought, including in their bizarreness, there are very th there are special things that are bizarre about the valley networks of Mars, like the fact that they isolate large islands. You see islands in meandering valleys on Earth, but not when you have a, a small valley flowing at a trickle, um, a small river. Uh, anyway, we saw all these anomalies that we saw in the Martian valley networks, in the valley networks of Devon Island. And... The beauty of it is that the valley networks on Devon Island did not require a somehow a thick atmosphere to form or a warmer climate. They were all formed by the melting of ice sheets, by the melting at the bottom of ice sheets. And the overburden of ice is what provided the confining pressure to allow the liquid water to stay liquid and flow over long distances. What was warm at the time in early Mars, and that's easy to, to do and to model and to expect, was the ground. The ground was warmer. The planet was young. The, the heat flow, the heat, amount of heat coming out of the ground was, was steeper, was, was, more, was higher than it is today. There was volcanism that was much more active early in the planet's history. The impacts coming in from deep space of asteroids and comets were much more frequent. So the ground had many reasons to be warmer than it is today. Uh, and this was actually recycling water uh, into the atmosphere. But as soon as the water hit the atmosphere, it would just freeze onto the surface. So the climate was probably frigid throughout Martian history. Only the ground was warm at times and here and there. And when it was warm enough, it would melt these ice covers from their base and carve out these valley networks. And so uh, we, we were really delighted by, by this... Um, by this finding because at the very least it undermined the automatic assumption that somehow the valley networks on Mars were formed under a warm climate. At the very least it, it has forced us to, to consider the alternate hypothesis which is that they are actually cold climate features uh, formed uh, underneath ice covers and, and the whole er faint early sun paradox for Mars goes away. There's no more issue with that 
uh, when you consider this. So anyway, uh, that's just to give you a sense of uh, what we're trying to do next, which is to quantify this a little bit better, to understand how much ice has melted to form these valley networks on Devon Island. Uh, did they form over one episode of ice melting or several? Uh, what amounts of discharges are we talking about? Was it a lot of water going through there or not a lot? So it's a painstaking piece of work. It takes repeated field seasons uh, and, and we're working on it. It's really interesting. Good story. Yeah. Um, Pascal, you recently proposed a robotic mission to Mars's moons. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about why you believe they are important destinations? Well, the moons of Mars in the big picture of the universe are not very important bodies. Uh, but from our perspective, they, I think they're important because they're in Mars orbit. And uh, for, for scientists who, like myself or Tom who want to see humans go to Mars uh, someday, uh, going to Mars orbit is a lot easier to do than going to the surface of Mars itself. You don't need to have the habitat uh, set up on Mars. You don't need to have a very lightweight spacesuit available yet. You don't need to have all kinds of rovers and vehicles to get you around to be a productive explorer on Mars. All of this stuff, getting to the bulk of the cost of a human mission to Mars lies in that portion where you have to go from Mars orbit to the surface of Mars and back. Uh, that's If you want to do that part, that's where you have a lot of cost come in, uh, a lot of engineering that needs to go into things. So, if you were somehow only interested in going to the surface of Mars and never dwelling in Mars orbit, uh, you could one day go to Mars, but it's going to take a lot of uh, funding and a very steep curve for that to get everything ready in time for you to, to sort of have everything set up there in one go and go to Mars. Mars orbit, in contrast, is a lot more accessible. I mean, we could almost go there right now uh, uh, with relatively, for, for example, the spacesuit we have that Tom has used on EVAs outside the space station, uh, it essentially would allow him to survive and stay alive and do a productive EVA if he had it around Mars. So uh, uh, you don't have to reinvent the spacesuit, or at least not really adapt it in a significant way. Uh, same with a lot of our spacecraft systems. We, we have what it takes pretty much uh, at this point, to to be successful in a human mission to Mars orbit, uh, and 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 so it's a lot easier to do. It can therefore be done much sooner, which, in my view, is really critical. Uh, it would allow the ball to go to Mars itself to get rolling, uh, and so programmatically, it's very exciting to go to Mars orbit first uh, uh, because it it I think will ultimately make going to Mars itself happens sooner and better. Now, going to Mars orbit itself, what are you going to do? Well, Mars happens to have two moons, and they happen to be very intriguing. They are very exciting because we don't know what they are. And in fact, ironically, uh, they were these are bodies that were discovered by an American astronomer in 1877, Azaf Hall at the Naval Observatory in Washington. And... Uh, for most of their known life, they, they've been just points of light. But since the Mariner uh, 6 and 7 days and the Viking uh, Mariner 9 as well and Viking 1 and 2, we, we know that they are essentially uh, giant potatoes in orbit around Mars. And one theory is that they are captured asteroids. But there are many more theories that have been added to this initial idea. Uh, another one is that they might be captured comets. Uh, another one is that they might be uh, bits and pieces of Mars blasted out into space by past giant impacts on Mars and reassembled into into these little leftovers. Um, another theory is that they're actually leftovers from the very formation of Mars itself. So they would date back to the origin of the planet and to all the planets of the inner solar system. So these are radically different ideas. They would imply radically different compositions. Um, and we don't know what they are. So I think that we can address their origin by robotic mission, but one of these possibilities is very intriguing to me, is the fact that they might be uh, captured dead comets. Uh, and there's nothing in what we know about them that really precludes that at this stage. And if anything, you might uh, even 
I think that that's actually one of the more one of the better substantiated ideas, and that's because um, if you if you were to take Phobos and Deimos among if you were to consider these two little moons among the population of near Earth asteroids or near Earth small bodies, near Earth objects as they're called, Phobos and Deimos would rank uh, right now as as number three and number five. Okay. Hmm. If you included them in all, okay, so there's only two small bodies in the inner solar system that are bigger than them. It's asteroid 433 Eros, which the near spacecraft has rendezvoused with uh, and even landed on. Uh, there's another asteroid called Ganymede that nobody's visited yet, but we're not expecting it to be particularly exciting. Uh, the third asteroid in size, so to speak, if it were an asteroid, would be Phobos. Uh, and then the fifth one is Deimos. So who's number four? Well, number four is a very strange object called 3552 Don Quixote. <laughs> <laughs> 3552 Don Quixote uh, is not uh, a well-known asteroid. I mean, f for one thing, it's the 3,552nd asteroid discovered, I guess. So, so uh, it's not even a, a sort of a compelling object in the sky. But as it turns out, is it's the near-Earth small body that's number four in size. And it's on a very weird orbit. The orbit is inclined 30 degrees off of the plane of the ecliptic. So that's the plane of all the planets around the sun. It's an inclined orbit. It's, a, it's on an orbit that crosses the orbit of Jupiter, Mars, uh, the Earth. Okay. So it's a, it's a very bizarre... Uh, sorry, it doesn't cross the orbit of... It crosses the orbit of Jupiter and Mars, but it grazes the orbit of the Earth. Uh, Don Quixote, as it turns out, and we've known this only since 2014, uh, is emitting gases. It's emitting CO2. Uh, it's uh, spectrally, in other words, if you analyze the light that's coming on it, you would put it in the category of asteroids known as the D-type of asteroids. That, means, that just means that they're very dark and very red. Mm -hmm. very, very red in color, very dark. Well, Don Quixote... Uh, of course, is the largest D-type asteroid in, in the inner solar system. D-types are very common in the outer solar system, like uh, in the outer main belt or uh, when you start getting close to the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, you find many D-type asteroids out there. But Don Quixote is a, is a relatively large D-type asteroid. And it, again, in 2014, for the first time, showed signs of activity. It's releasing CO2, okay, which... Given the, the weird shape of its orbit, the inclination of it, the, um, the, uh, the fact that it's uh, uh, spectrally similar to objects you find only in the outer solar system, uh, uh, the, all, 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 this, all these lines of evidence are pointing to the, to the fact that it, it's likely a captured dying comet. Okay. Hmm. Well, captured, I mean, captured in the inner solar system, but it's a dying comet nucleus. And so... That to me is really intriguing because Phobos and Deimos are essentially similar in size to Don Quixote, and they're both D-type. They are both very dark and very red. Same spectral type, right? Same, same spectral type, essentially. So, you know, and since Phobos and Deimos might have been captured very early in the solar system's history, they might essentially be ice-rich, if not comets, ice-rich bodies that were captured early in the solar system's history and are still now lingering around, around Mars. Their top surface you would not expect there to be a lot of ice anymore. And sure enough, there's no sign of ice on either Phobos or Deimos in spectra. But who knows about what's happening deeper down, like maybe 100 meters down. Uh, they could be lumps of ice. So uh, that would be really very exciting to a certain. And that could actually be a game changer as well for humans going to Mars if, if somehow we had ready access to, to ice uh, in, in Mars orbit. Uh, because, of course, ice, you can use that not just to drink, if you melt it, uh, or make cocktails, but you can use it to, uh, <laughs> you can use it as rocket fuel. You break down the hydrogen and the oxygen from the water, uh, and there you go. So, uh, so, therefore, among the possibilities of composition of what Phobos and Deimos are, there's this very intriguing possibility that they could be leftover dead comets, uh, and, and that would be a total game changer. So much of a game changer that it would be worth. It's really worth putting some time and effort into figuring out what they are, 
uh, and in preparation for humans going to Mars. Anything going on right now that's programmatically approved to actually get at this problem, or is your proposal the only one that's out there? Well, that's a that's a good one. So, here's the quick uh, rundown on the history of that. The Russians have expressed interest in Phobos and Nemos a long time ago. They sent two probes in 1988. The first one was lost on its way to Phobos. It was a human error. They told the antenna to point away from the Earth, and then there was no software to tell the antenna to look for the Earth after that. So they were done. Some guy is regretting that move in Siberia somewhere, I think, <laughs> today. The, the second probe made it to Mars orbit, was on final approach to Phobos, and something went wrong. The official story is that it's, the electronics failed, but uh, it disappeared just before its closest approach to, 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 to within a, about 100 meters of Phobos. Uh, the, and then there was a big lull. There was no more interest or funding in Phobos exploration. And then just in 2011, uh, Russia was able to finally put together the follow-up to that, a mission called Phobos Grunt. Grunt uh, in Russian means uh, soil. It's the same root as the word ground. Uh, and Phobos Grunt was supposed to land on Phobos to collect samples, to do all kinds of other things as well, but to collect samples and to fly them back to the Earth. Well, unfortunately, the spacecraft was had a problem at launch, and it uh, it uh, the upper stage uh, did not ignite, and it basically fell back into the Pacific Ocean off the coast of uh, Chile. So anyway, that was um, a big loss. And since then, the Russians have been trying to refly Phobos Grunt. So this happened back in 2011. Been trying to refly Phobos Grunt, uh, but don't have the uh, finances really to do this immediately. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Europeans have been working on a Phobos sample return mission. It was called Footprint for a while with PH instead of F, um, Footprint. Uh, as a Phobos sample return mission, but it's now called simply Phobos sample return. And they are in phase A. So that's the first sort of uh, careful phase of study of a potential mission. It's in phase A right now. The phase A is supposed to end in June of this year, June or July. And as a result of the phase A, they will get a European Space Agency will have a, a big, uh, thick report. So phase A is basically a feasibility study. Mm -hmm detailed feasibility study, and based on the results of the phase A, they'll decide to whether to go forward with it or not. Uh, the Russians are part of that effort, so the Russians are now uh, sort of a, a partner of this ESA mission called Phobos Sample Return. But then, um, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the, uh, how hot Phobos and Deimos are, uh, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency just announced about a year ago that it was considering uh, possibly a Phobos or Deimos sample return and have been hurriedly doing a Phase A study and have just now announced, uh, or about to, it's uh, hot off the press, that they're going to go for a Phobos sample return mission. Uh, so that's a mission called MMX, Mars Moon Explorer or Exploration. And... Um, the goal is to launch in 2022, so that's, that's as soon as anybody could possibly launch. Mm -hmm. uh, and samples would be back on Earth by 2025, so uh, fast track. Um, and then in the meantime, while this was the, these studies were happening, uh, NASA had a discovery mission proposal uh, round last year, and three missions were proposed, and I led the, the study of just one of the three. Three missions were proposed, one out of uh, the Applied Physics Lab at um, Johns Hopkins University in Maryland, the other one out of JPL, and the third one, our little mission, uh, led by NASA Ames, was called PADME. PADME uh, stood for Phobos and Deimos and Mars Environment. It was a very small mission using essentially the same spacecraft bus as the spacecraft that uh, flew to the moon uh, that was called Laddie. And um, anyway, this little spacecraft was not going to land on Phobos or Deimos or do anything complicated. It was just going to go into orbit around Mars, do 16 flybys of Phobos, followed by nine flybys of Deimos. And flybys would have been so close to both bodies that we would have learned everything we needed to know to figure out their composition uh, based on the 
the key hypotheses that are floating out there. But none of these Phobos missions were selected by NASA, I have to say. It's hard to figure out, given that NASA is actively talking about sending human explorers to Mars orbit in the early 2030s. So they, they seemingly need that information. wonder how they'll get it. Yeah. My read of that, Tom, is that uh, NASA knows it needs to get some information about Phobos, but might want to do it uh, sort of really in consultation with what the human mission program, mm -hmm. what the human program might need. And so it might be taking a step back to think more carefully at the problem uh, and not jump into any, any particular um, uh, sort of PI-led mission for that. Maybe do a directed mission that would be focused on answering uh, the, you know, the, the big questions that are needing answers for the human program. That's my guess. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Are there plans to fit uh, Phobos and Deimos into, you know, the, the kind of future plans for, for getting humans to Mars? Well, um, I'm aware that uh, there, there are, there's, a, there's active work that's going on led by Johnson's, the Johnson Space Center, uh, but involves, it involves actually the other centers as well, but it's led by Johnson, on uh, looking at different architectures for human missions to Phobos and Deimos. What might we do? How might we do it? Uh, what kind of spacecraft would we take? How many days would we, would we want to be there? Uh, and of course, as these studies, as the studies taking place, all kinds of questions are coming up. As in, well, do we know what the bearing strength is? How how hard is the ground? For, could you land on it, for example? Could you could you contact it safely? Could you anchor yourself on Phobos and Deimos? Could you do this or could you do that? So all these questions that are. Uh, now being brought up by the different architectures that are considered are going to be in need of an answer. And I, I think what we're seeing is a probably a pretty significant robotic mission, probably a lander and maybe even a sample return mission that NASA is going to somehow have to put together to answer all these specific questions that we have about these places or, uh, before we can finalize our, our plans for humans. So that, that's sort of the uh, idea of a robotic precursor mission mm -hmm. that uh, NASA will have to come up with. Uh, I just want to add that in the meantime, um, NASA has already announced that uh, in Mars 2020, it's sending a new rover sort of in the class of Curiosity to Mars to collect some samples and cache them on Mars. But as the, as the following mission in 2022, NASA would be launching a Mars orbiter, a communications orbiter, uh, that would probably do a Phobos and Deimos reconnaissance before settling in, onto its primary mission orbit, which is in low Mars orbit. So that's the same launch window as Japan's uh, Phobos sample return mission. So maybe NASA and Japan will be working together. The European mission, if it, if it comes together, is looking at a launch date that's later than that, uh, probably no earlier than 2024 for launch. So Pascal, give us some idea of how you would operate on the surface of Phobos or Deimos. What's the gravity like there? Tom, as you know, uh, small bodies have very low gravities. The gravity on Phobos, which is the large of the two moons, is 1,700 times less than the gravity on Earth. <laughs> so that's very much like my spacewalking experience on the space station. Uh, you know, maybe if I waited an hour, I might drift down to the surface from a yes. height of a couple of feet. You, you would be much better qualified than I am to describe how this might uh, feel like. But I can tell you that it's still not the same as zero gravity, as, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, uh, in other words, if you are, say, standing on Phobos, and some of you could just stand there, um, you could just push yourself up, uh, you know, with, uh, with a push on your legs, and you could rise uh, up to a mile high above this body, and then slowly fall back down. You know, it would take minutes uh, until you land back on your feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you would still be bound to this body uh, gravitationally. Uh, there's a, uh, between Phobos, Phobos is very close to Mars, I should add. Phobos is very close to Mars. In fact, when you're standing on Phobos and you look at Mars, it's this gigantic, uh, awesome uh, orb in, in your sky, it's like a lantern. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, it's about a third of the diameter of the, the sky overhead. 
Yeah, exactly. It's Mars is 6,400 times bigger than our moon is in our sky. Wow. Uh, so gives you a sense of the, uh, the awesomeness of that. Anyway, there, there's a gravitational um, uh, balance point, if you will, between Mars and Phobos. That's called the L1 uh, Lagrange point. And as you know, that's, that's exactly the sort of the theoretical location where Mars is going to be attracting you as much as Phobos is. So unless you go past that point, you're going to stay bound to Phobos gravitationally. Uh, and that point in, along the line, the Phobos-Mars line, is, is about two kilometers off the surface of Phobos. So <laughs> if you jump off the surface of Phobos in the direction of Mars with Mars overhead, if you will, uh, you, you better make sure you don't jump past two kilometers or so because mm-hmm. you won't fall back down on Phobos. You will essentially uh, just stay in orbit around Mars and, and fall towards Mars progressively. I, I think that's a great spot through which to route a tether that would allow you to, yes. to shinny your way up and down from a docking port or a, a, you know, a, a pier up yeah. there at the Lagrange point. And that's where your arriving and departing spacecraft might come from. Phobos and Deimos are fascinating in terms of their exploration potential. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. So good. And, and you had mentioned the potential for for Phobos and Deimos to harbor you know, resources like water in the form of ice. Are there? Do you think there are other materials that could be used to reach Mars on those moons? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, the water could be in the form of ice. It could also be in the form of uh, minerals that are hydrated. Mm-hmm. So uh, Tom knows that among the the primitive asteroids that um, Phobos and Deimos could be uh, sort of part of. There are many that are carbon rich and and also clay rich. So so there could be clays, in other words, minerals that are rich uh, in in water that are part of Phobos's or Deimos's uh, sort of makeup. Now beyond that, other resources would be organics. Uh, there are some scenarios that are proposing that Phobos and Deimos could be rich in organic matter. Of course, not of biological origin, but there are ways to make organic materials on asteroids. Uh, through through essentially mineral chemistry, and uh, we might actually be able to take advantage of that to find some uh, carbon rich compounds and extract them and use them at the surface of Phobos and Deimos. Beyond that, uh, the mere fact that these places have regolith, uh, so loose soil, uh, loose regolith. If they have loose regolith, that's very important because that means that you could move material around relatively easily. Um, and shelter yourself from space radiation. So space radiation, of course, is a, is a long-term hazard in any enterprise for humans in space and deep space. You're not uh, immune from space radiation when you're on Phobos. Of course, you're already protected by uh, half the sky, of course, is, is, is going to shield you. I mean, the ground will shield you from, from half the sky. But you still have radiation coming from the other side. Even when you're on the side of Phobos that's facing Mars at all times, with Mars occupying a good fraction of the sky, you, you still have substantial radiation raining down on you from the sides. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so therefore, any long-term presence of humans on Phobos was going to need some radiation shielding, um, including the electronics, for example, that might need shielding. So one solution, of course, is to, is to bury yourself in loose rubble uh, you might create a. We have robots on Earth that make sandbags. Uh, there are machines that do sandbags. So you can imagine doing regolith bags uh, on Phobos and, and sort of piling them on around your habitat um, and creating essentially radiation shielding that way. Hmm. Um, uh, so those are the kinds of resources that uh, that I think come to mind immediately. Um, some scenarios suggest that. Uh, Phobos and Deimos might have collected pieces of Mars over time, uh, ex- kicked off from Mars by impacts. Okay, so they themselves could be, we said earlier, leftovers from impact debris from Mars. But even if they were not, they could still be collecting impact debris from Mars over time. And in any case, uh, what this means is that you could find on Phobos uh, a sampling of Martian rocks that has accumulated there throughout Martian history, as long as impacts have been hitting Mars and as long as Phobos has been there, uh, collecting basically space debris coming off of Mars, including rocks that might have signatures of life from early in Mars' history. Mm -hmm. So 
I wrote a paper many years ago that sort of described this as Phobos' regolith being a, a library of Alexandria of life on Mars. Mm, uh, mm -hmm. Because Mars itself actually might not even preserve some of that. Mars, the surface of Mars is very oxidizing. There's chemistry going on. It's pretty aggressive. You might imagine that there could be early forms of fossil life on Mars that uh, appeared early in Mars's history that might be findable, but they might be altered significantly by the weathering that has taken place over time, uh, including water circulating. Um, whereas if that stuff had been somehow, uh, if you had early life form of, form of Mars uh, trapped in rocks in the form of early fossils and expelled into space and, and somehow buried in the Phobos regolith, well, unless they got shattered by later impacts, they could be pretty well preserved. Uh, so you you have this irony that the best record of early life on Mars might actually be found on Phobos as opposed to Mars itself. Hmm. Well, it sounds like the uh, proposals to do mining of near-Earth asteroids might develop some techniques that 20 years down the line might be used to uh, exploit these resources on Phobos. Are, are you involved at all with any of the asteroid mining uh, proposals or activities? Um, I'm following that academically. I'm not uh, myself involved in uh, asteroid mining. I, um, uh, as much as I believe in uh, a great future where asteroids will yield uh, mining resources, uh, to, to me, I, I, I have a hard time shaking this this impression that uh, t telling us that there are resources on asteroids today, it's a bit like telling the Vikings there, there was oil in the North Sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true, uh, there are resources, but it's really hard to get to. And not only that, it's hard to get to and extract and exploit to the point where it's actually uh, commercially, economically viable. In other words, you the return on investment is, is high enough to justify the investment itself. Mm -hmm. So I'm not uh, one second trying to slow down the efforts of investing into this. I think I'm a big believer in it. But what I'm saying is that that is a prospect that's going to require a lot of uh, faith uh, and precisely investment before uh, an economic return is, is, is there. Uh, so I follow asteroid mining uh, but but a bit from a distance, I I'm somehow not tying that to our our future in exploring Mars and, and Phobos right. and Deimos. Not a prerequisite. Um, so Pascal, what what's your opinion of private efforts to getting humans to Mars? First of all, I think we all realize that going to Mars is is not uh, you know. Uh, I mean, going to Mars is the mother of all camping trips, okay? But it's a lot more than a camping trip. It's really a very difficult thing to do mm -hmm. properly and safely. And first of all, it will never be safe, really. But uh, having said that, it, you, you, you need to put the odds on your side to sort of be able to survive a mission like this. So in all the private efforts to actually go to Mars that are declared, I only find one that's credible, and it's the one of SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk has this rocket company that actually has the stated goal of getting us to Mars ultimately. That's actually the company's goal. Mm -hmm. It's not an option for them. It's, it's, it's why they exist. Uh, and, and, you know, so far, I think everybody's impressed, really, by how fast they've come uh, along and how good they are in, in pulling off uh, all the milestones that they set, have set themselves in achieving, you know, uh, low-cost launch to Earth orbit, successful docking of the space station, uh, successful landing of a first stage of the rocket. And, you know, there are many challenges ahead, but this company is sort of knows what the challenges of going to Mars are. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's one effort out there that's private that could possibly make it, the only one that I see right now would be SpaceX or a consortium led by SpaceX. Now, uh, NASA, of course, is not a private effort. I see NASA being able to do it, but it's going to take a very specific line of leadership, uh, you know, in the White House, in Congress, uh, to, to make that happen uh, when it's supposed to, which is at this point in the mid-30s to early 40s. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing, at least at NASA, the right thing. I think we do need a giant rocket and whether it should be built by NASA itself or by, or by industry more directly, I, 
that's a uh, open matter. But the, the big rocket, I think, is a, is a good step. But this rocket that we're building will be very expensive to operate, and we're going to need more than just one rocket per per moon, you know, per landing. It's going to be something like six or seven before we can put a human on Mars. So we're looking at uh, uh, a real commitment that that has to happen. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, I, I, I have to say, uh, in terms of a declared goal to go to Mars, you know, by a certain deadline. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but all the other private efforts, Mars One, for example, which is the idea to send essentially volunteers on a one-way mission to mm-hmm. colonize Mars and, and, of course, die there. Uh, th- those are completely hokey, in my view, because it's not so much the idea of being committed to going to Mars so badly that you you'd consider staying there, it's it's the fact that these are undertakings that have no technical uh, credibility in their underpinning. They they they're not uh, they they they're not really credible technically mm-hmm. to pull this off. And that's that's uh, that's all I can say. So mm-hmm. you know I I feel a sort of a kinship with those who still want to go to Mars for with Mars One and the Mars Society and other groups. Uh, there's a kinship in the sense that you know we we all want to see humans explore Mars and we want to go there, but at some level I wonder if it doesn't uh, detract from us actually achieving that goal by by coming up with some uh, sort of marginal concepts of making that happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Uh, so if you can look into the future and see humans getting to Mars one day. As a planetary scientist, where else should human explorers lend their expertise? Um, the way I see it is uh, you, you, we're, we're precisely doing some work on Devon Island, but not just there. Uh, in many places where we're trying to focus really on identifying what we need to be successful on Mars. So I can tell you that here's a scenario that I personally uh, feel comfortable with. I, I think we need a spacesuit that is significantly lighter than the one we have. Right now... We have a spacesuit that weighs, on Earth, about 300 pounds. Tom was able to wear it several times uh, during his EVAs. Uh, and, of course, he, he felt the inertia, the mass of a 300-pound suit, but he didn't feel the weight of it. He, he felt it was pretty much weightless. Uh, that suit, uh, if you took it to the moon, or if you took the Apollo suit to the moon, which also weighed about 300 pounds, I mean, two, 260 pounds, uh, this current spacesuit we have would have a felt weight on the moon of about 50 pounds. So that's bearable. The, the lunar gravity is uh, 17% of what it is on Earth, so six times less. If you take that same suit that Tom wore in low Earth orbit to Mars, first of all, it doesn't have walking joints or things like that, but let's say it does. Uh, it would have a felt weight on Mars under uh, gravity that's 38% of what it is on Earth. It would have a felt weight of 125 pounds still. That is too heavy to, to be an effective field worker. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, you could do a few steps with that, but it'd be like wearing a, you know, <laughs> uh, one of these early diving suits <laughs> at the bottom of the ocean. You, you couldn't mm-hmm. really bend down to pick up anything. Uh, you'd be really impaired. And, um, and again, it doesn't even have the joints that you need to bend down easily and pop back up. So, so there's a real challenge here. We often say, hey, we're Going to Mars is just a matter of will. Uh, I, I'd say that there are some significant technical challenges still. So, so the spacesuit is one. We have to cut down the current mass of the spacesuit in half, uh, from 300 pounds to uh, about uh, 150 pounds. So that by the time you go to Mars, 38% of 150 pounds, that's about 60 pounds. Uh, you have a spacesuit that that weighs that has a felt weight of about sixty pounds, mm-hmm. and that will still not be light, but it will be uh, be better. But that's a huge challenge to cut down the mass of the current spacesuit in half. You're looking at some radical changes here. Um, you, you know, a spacesuit is already uh, lean and mean by definition, um, and Tom knows full well that it's 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 not just clothing; it's uh, it's a wearable spacecraft. So so you have to be uh, if I was an aerospace engineer or a kid going into engineering, that, that's sort of what I would do. I would go into spacesuit design because, first of all, it's fascinating. It's the ultimate uh, sexy spaceship to design. It's the one that molds <laughs> And the absolutely human body. enabling and essential. <laughs> yes. I, 
think your colleague uh, Tom Mike Gernhardt said some, something to the effect that spacesuit is is not a pleasure to wear. It's uh, it's it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd agree with that. Okay, but uh, uh, you know, spacesuit is a wearable spacecraft, and to, to just say okay, let's cut the mass of this in half is is easier said than done. You're looking at new materials, maybe new solutions. One one solution we're thinking uh, could actually help on Devon Island is to, when it comes to Mars not consider the, the human being on foot as being the exploration entity, but it's a human being with his or her ATV, the all-terrain vehicle, sort of a personal all-terrain quad bike, uh, where you could offload a lot of the mass that you're carrying in your backpack onto that vehicle so that uh, you either tie to your little rover with an umbilical or you are uh, able to recharge your backpack, which would have smaller tanks, Smaller batteries, uh, with, with you know, with with oxygen and electrical power, uh, while you're riding that thing. So to, to create sort of a buddy system where you have essentially uh, ride, you know, following you on wheels uh, in robotic mode, uh, a vehicle that you can drive when you're riding on it, and f- that follows you when you're not when you're walking, and and you and that machine become the exploration system. Uh, so so that you're never having to wear a heavy spacesuit, and, and meanwhile, you still have access, immediate access when needed, to to extra oxygen, extra power. Oh, that's a great idea. Well, uh, again, that's also easier said than done. Right. <laughs> uh, so, so then it has to pass the muster of astronauts, you know, testing it out. In fact, Tom, we're going to rope you in, I think, uh, uh, into helping advise us if you if you're willing to to sort of test this mode of operation where you'd somehow have to be tied to to an ATV uh, while exploring the surroundings on Devon Island in a spacesuit. Maybe we could do something like this together. I think it would be a, a fun uh, mode to try out, giving you a, a still have some independence, but you've got some safety and some reassurance that you can retreat. Yes, yeah, exactly. But anyway, just to give you an illustration of the ideas that are being floated, uh, it's, it's not just cutting back on the mass of the spacesuit itself, it's sort of offloading it uh, with with uh, some other system that that keeps you still safe. So, um, Pascal, you uh, had talked about spacesuit design as being kind of a new and sexy area to jump into. Do you think there are any other areas, if if you were to start all over again as a young scientist, that you would look to as being a challenging and exciting uh, area to go into as a researcher? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, all this in the spirit of making a human mission to Mars happen uh, sooner rather than later, I, I think it's very important that we go back to nuclear thermal uh, thermal, well, nuclear thermal rockets, NTRs. Nuclear thermal rockets were were developed uh, and considered at least for for human space missions in the 60s. Uh, in fact, the there was a plan to replace the third stage, the upper stage of the Saturn V rocket, with a nuclear thermal rocket uh, that would um, have uh, sort of be a very efficient propulsion system and cut down the duration of a trip to Mars from what it is now, which is between seven and nine months, to something that's closer to four to six months or something like that. So nuclear thermal uh, propulsion is is a mature idea. Uh, it's a mature concept. It's been tested in, in the desert, at, in Nevada in particular, at, um, during the 60s. The program was canceled by President Nixon, but, but it, uh, it's been revived sort of in a, at least in a quiet way right now, uh, and with mostly paper studies, as, as I understand it, but it's really worth pushing stronger uh, on because uh, I, th- I think that's really the uh, a key way to make a human mission to Mars happen, mm-hmm. which is to, to cut down the, the travel time back and forth to Mars. Uh, and that would be a significant cut. That would bring it down by half or even more, two or two-thirds. So a very significant thing. And what the reason why... Nuclear thermal rockets are so efficient is because currently in, in in rockets, you well in cryogenic rockets like the ones like Saturn V rockets or the space shuttle uh, main rockets uh, main engines, you're you're burning hydrogen and oxygen, and what you expel from the nozzle of your rocket engine is is water essentially. Uh, so 
Water is a heavy molecule. It's, it's got two hydrogens and, and an oxygen, which bears the bulk of the weight. And the heavier the gas you expel, the slower it can possibly be expelled. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do in the ideal rocket is to expel the, the lightest gas possible. And so the beauty of a nuclear thermal rocket is that uh, the only gas, the only propellant you're using is hydrogen. There's no chemical combustion. You just carry the lightest gas possible that's sort of easy to find and stable hydrogen. And you run this hydrogen through a superheated engine, if you will. Uh, it's just essentially, a, that's the nuclear reactor. You run it through the nuclear reactor. And a nuclear reactor will heat up this gas so dramatically, so quickly, and so highly that the gas will get expelled out of the nozzle, the rocket, at, at uh, tremendous speeds. And so you will be able to achieve the greatest um, you know, specific impulse, it's called rocketry, but the point is it's the, the greatest propulsion efficiency for, for your rocket. And that will uh, give you stronger accelerations in space and more maneuverability, and most importantly, it will cut down the travel time to Mars to, to, to just a few months. Uh, so I think we need to revive this program if it isn't already somehow in secret, and I don't know that. Uh, but uh, we need to revive the the nuclear thermal rocket program, and and uh, there's a there's a there's a way to do safe nuclear in space. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much fear sometimes that nuclear is going to be put to to evil um, work that we we don't dare touch it. But I think it's really the way to go. Curiosity has a radioisotopic generator now. You can't do it with solar panels on Mars for for big rovers. For for our future on Mars and space exploration in general, we have to go nuclear. It's it's, it's the way stars are powered, and there's no reason why we shouldn't do that in space ourselves. I agree with you on that. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. So let me ask you my last question, and that is... Um, that, um, Pascal, you were nice enough to give me a copy of your book, uh, Mission Mars, uh, a book about exploring the red planet for young people. Um, what kind of reaction have you had to that, and are you working on something new? Uh, well, thanks, Tom. Yeah, uh, Mission Mars is published by Scholastic. It's a, it's a small paperback book. On, it, I sort of wrote it as a training manual for kids. And I've gotten feedback from adults, from program managers, from astronauts like yourself, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the most rewarding to me personally actually have been the, the feedback that I've gotten from kids and uh, kids in school sometimes. Uh, the, the fact that I get the sense that somehow this is getting them really interested in, in, uh, in space travel or uh, going to Mars or even just science and engineering in general is, is just very rewarding. So um, the feedback has been very touching, very rewarding. And the reason why I wrote this book is because when I was – uh, the age of the kids that I that this book targets, I I was people were walking on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just an incredible thing. Uh, and I, I don't know if you are old or younger than me, Tom, but basically I'm sure you recall that too, more or less. And very well. Okay. And you know that was a life changing uh, experience, which of course I didn't mention earlier, but it, it was an amazing thing to see people walk on the moon. And it was clear that the next step would be to go to Mars. And at the time, you could you could find all kinds of books for kids that showed you the inner workings of the spacecraft, how the rocket, the Saturn V rocket was uh, worked, how the spacesuits were uh, worked, what types of uh, lunar landers might be used, what types of rovers you might use on the moon. Uh, and meanwhile, looking around just a few years ago, there was there was no book about that for Mars. There was nothing that somehow could could sort of portray this dream of ours as adults into the dream of, of kids today. So, so that was a big incentive for me to spend some time writing a children's book uh, to get the message out and to get them excited. And if anything, if the only result is that they, they don't go into the space program but just get into, interested in science and engineering and technology, that's, that's enough of a success in itself for, for the future. 
Absolutely. And I know for me personally, on the on the undersea medicine side of things, you know, it was uh, reading Jacques Cousteau books is the same thing, just yes. getting that introduction into a different world. So, and you, exactly. you had talked about, so your book, and you talked about when you were younger reading Carl Sagan and how much of an impact that had. And even when you went to do your winter over, how you took so many books with you <laughs> during your winter over. Um, so it sounds like you like to read and books are very influential in your life. What do you like to read now? And do you have any recommendations for our listeners? I have lots of recommendations. <laughs> I, I can say that for somebody who's really inspired by uh, space travel, incidentally, I would recommend reading Tom's biography, uh, Skywalking. And I'm not, uh, this is not lip service. This is, <laughs> This was this is really the best book written by an astronaut on the experience of space travel. Very grateful. Thanks. What Tom wrote about the feeling of a launch in the space shuttle, the preparation for that, the the uh, the the things that have to do with the morale of the crew. It's, it's just fantastic writing, mm -hmm. and it's fantastic writing because it uh, it takes you there. It, uh, it it basically makes you become part of the crew and part of Tom's life. So it's really very very moving. Um, Okay, so one book that I really enjoyed reading recently uh, actually came out a few years ago. It's called Bold Endeavors. Bold Endeavors is written by Jack Stuster. Um, he's a, a historian and also a, a psychologist. And it's about lessons learned uh, in polar exploration that can be applied to space travel. Hmm. It's a very insightful book. First of all, it does a synthetic analysis of, of sort of all the things you wonder about often about expeditions and Polar, polar expeditions and what might have happened to crew morale and how, how the whole dynamic works with the, with the leader, etc. So it's very instructive from that, from that historical perspective alone. But the way Jack does, does this work is that he, he also applies it to, to our future in space. Uh, and it's, it's very insightful. It's a very, very good book. So it's a must read for anybody who's interested in, in the human being in space and, and its future and his future or her future. Perfect. Thank you, Pascal. Is there anything else that you want us to throw in there before we sign off? Well, I'm working on another book. Uh, I'm working on a book for grown-ups, and uh, it's called From Earth to Mars. And sort of stealing a title that's reminiscent of Jules Verne, <laughs> it's a nonfiction book. And it's about the work that we're doing here on Earth to get ready to go to Mars. There's no firm date yet. I'm targeting Christmas of next year. But... Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, we'd be on a short, short fuse. I mean, Christmas of 2017, we're talking about. Well, Pascal, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. STEM talk. 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 Wow, that was lots of fun. Pascal is certainly a guy with many deep interests and passions. And in addition to the discussion of space topics, I particularly enjoyed him talking about his time in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. I was only there for a week, and I can confirm that it is an awesome experience. Pascal spent well over a year there, including the winter. That's a long time on the ice. It's a very long time. In addition to co-founding the Mars Institute, Pascal is deeply involved in SETI, an organization that seeks evidence of life in the universe by looking for some signature of its technology. NASA continues to attract talented folks from around the world who are fascinated by space and how we might explore it. Pascal is a great example of this. Absolutely. I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where one can find the show notes for this episode and find pointers to Pascal's book and links to the Mars Institute and SETI, stemtalk.us. Don, you and Tom Jones did a nice job on this interview. Tom and Pascal really connected as both are planetary scientists and share several interests. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until next time we meet on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.